I can't tell you how excited I am to talk to you guys and how appreciative I am to speak to an audience of people who understand how important data is. And even more to understand how data can mislead us so horribly. How we can have an incredibly exciting data set that doesn't have the piece we need and we make the wrong decision. That's a really terrible outcome. In human rights, it's even more terrible. We have a saying in human rights that's already been said once tonight, that we speak truth to power. Let me propose to you that if we're going to do that, it better be true. <laughs> and with statistics, that's actually very, very hard. As, as uh, Eva mentioned, I've been at this about 25 years. And we've worked, my colleagues and I have worked with groups from as small as tiny little uh, non-governmental organizations in Sierra Leone and in El Salvador to the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights of the United Nations, and many, many groups in between, universities, big international human rights groups, UN missions, and so forth. And what all these groups share is an interest in knowing the truth, in knowing what is the big picture. Now, if you want the video, Oren's got your back, OK? And if you want to know the ecosystem of how those groups are all going to work together, hey, Regan can help you out. But if you need to know the numbers, if you need to convict someone for responsibility for a policy of violence, that's where we come in. We're not about helping you understand a particular event, but rather the conjuncture of events that indicate a policy of violence that is political responsibility. So I'm going to walk you through a couple of cases of that really quickly so that you can see what I mean. And I hope to, that you can um, share my concern that bad data can get you a bad answer and how we can fix that. So this is a pile of trash that a really good friend of mine and a friend of some of yours, I think, is standing in. And that pile of trash that Reed Brody from Human Rights Watch is standing in turn out to be the operational records of the secret police in Chad. Those are pretty important records, notwithstanding that they're mixed with chicken bones and rat feces. Um, and so after many, many machinations and almost 20 years of work, led by Reed and two really important human rights groups in Chad, we managed to organize those, uh, all of those records and identify the records from that that were the internal records of the detention centers of the police. And that's relevant because this man, this war criminal, the one in white, uh, <laughs> uh, turned out to stand trial for his crimes at the extraordinary African chambers in Senegal. He was the man, Hashan Habre was the president of Chad in the 1980s. And I'll focus on just one aspect of the trial, which had hundreds of witnesses. This is the evidence I presented. And I want to emphasize, this is not the most important evidence that convicted President Habre. But this is, statistical evidence is never the most important evidence. But it's crucial evidence explaining the policy of his violence, that the deaths in his prisons were not isolated incidents, the result of an occasional abusive guard, rather, this deaths peaking at over 0.62 deaths per 100 per day are a policy of sustained neglect. Neglect and abuse so severe that it, that mortality is 540 times the rate of normal adult mortality of men in Chad. Furthermore, it is three to five times greater than the mortality of US prisoners of war in Japanese custody in World War II. The reason that's relevant is because in the Tokyo Tribunal in 1947, the abuse of US prisoners by the Japanese was ruled a war crime. This statistic was cited three times in the verdict of the judges who convicted President Habre. And I think one reason that they cited my evidence so thoroughly is because it was so well written in French, because Catherine helped me edit it. And I appreciate her uh, <laughs> deeply for that assistance. But let me talk to you about the bigger problem. Something that we face all the time is that we get a bunch of databases. People send us databases. Our partners are accumulating lists of deaths. In Syria, we have five partners now. We have over 500,000 records of people dead in Syria. That's not 500,000 Syrians. That's 500,000 records. How many are duplicates? Now, this is a hard problem, because a third of all Syrian men share the name Mohammed. Okay? So we don't have social security numbers or national health numbers. We have no unique identifier. So the machine learning problem to deduplicate and integrate all these databases, well, I have to say, that's the really, really fun part of my job, actually, is writing that code. But the point is that if you can integrate those three databases, you're still left with a question. You're living in the world of the white circles. The data you can see 
but are you living in the world on the left where you can see a third of the data or are you living in the world on the right where you see almost all of it? These are very different worlds. And the reason they're so different is that what we don't know is different from what we do know. Now, I'm sorry to lead you down an epistemological path here, but if what we don't know is systematically different from what we do know, what is it that we know? <laughs> well, it turns out this is exactly what statistics is for. If we knew all the data, it wouldn't be statistics, it would be accounting. <laughs> and it's not accounting. It's statistics because we have to figure out what we don't know. And so this is the most exciting part of the talk. Let's do algebra. So. <laughs> So here's the story. I'm going to go through, I'm not going to do this derivation, although I have done it for judges in war crimes trials many times. Instead, I'm going to give you a metaphor. Imagine that you have two dark rooms. They are of different sizes. You'd like to know which is larger. The only tool you have to determine the size of the rooms is a handful of little rubber balls. And these balls have a curious property that when they hit each other, they make a noise. So you throw the balls into the first room, bounce, 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 and you hear you gather the balls, you go to the second room, you throw them with equal force. Which room's bigger? The second room is bigger, right? Because the balls have spread out. They have encountered each other less frequently, they've spread out. That intuition is what is formalized in this very simple derivation and is entirely uncoincidentally on the cover of our report, which I would love to uh, share with you. But the point is that this allows us to know what we don't know. It allows us to estimate the magnitude of what is not observed. And that's a crucial part of human rights work because violence is almost always unobserved. Violence is hidden by the perpetrators on purpose. It is distorted on purpose. And so in order for us to capture the patterns of reality, in order to hold powerful people accountable, we have to figure out what it is we don't know. And that's what we did in Guatemala. Here are my colleagues from a project I worked on throughout the 1990s. We gathered over uh, 19,000 stories from newspapers, from individual victims, um, and from other NGOs, and we accumulated them into a database. I aggregated that information with information from the Truth Commission, from the Catholic Church, from the National Program for, for Compensation, from exhumation records, and from many other sources. Thousands upon thousands of records to study the events of one specific area, three counties, the counties in which the Ishil people live. And the question was, did the army commit genocide against the Ishil people? Now, genocide does not mean mass killing. If they killed everyone, that could be the fog of war. Genocide means focused killing. It means specifically targeting some people and not targeting others. And so the calculation that we made is to compare the killing rates uh, between the two populations. And we found that the ratio of being killed for an indigenous person relative to a non-indigenous person is eight. To understand that differently, if you lived in one of these three counties in March of 1982, at the beginning of the regime of Jose Efrain Rios Mont, and you were an indigenous person, your probability of having been killed by the army was eight times greater than your non-indigenous neighbor. For context, that's called a relative risk in epidemiology. The relative risk of being Bosniak relative to being Serb was three. Tutsi versus Hutu was five. Eight. So this is evidence consistent with the claim by the prosecution that acts of genocide were committed by the army. And this was cited four times in the uh, verdict that the judges wrote. Uh, General Rios Mont was convicted. His conviction stood for 10 days and then reversed on a technicality. They ordered a new trial, it has not happened. Look, it's really important that we get the story right, so I'm gonna tell you one last story to close. This man, Edgar Fernando Garcia, was a student and labor leader in Guatemala in the early 1980s, and one day in February of 1984, he left his office and he didn't come home. His wife, it's not naive, she knew something could have happened. She looked everywhere. She went to police stations, she went to embassies, she went to the army bases, saying, do you have my husband? Do you know where he is? What has happened? Everyone says, I don't know. A few witnesses said, well, we think some people in civilian clothes put him into a car with no license plates, but that's all we've got. And that's where it stood. Now, she never gave up. She founded what became one of Guatemala's most important human rights groups, the Mutual Support Group. And now she's a very important politician in Guatemala. But in 2006, the historical archives of the National Police were discovered. 80 million pages of paper covered in dead insects, bat guano, 
and other filth and mold. These, uh, these had been abandoned after the transition uh, in Guatemala in 1996 uh, that had closed the, the national police in favor of a new civilian force. And when those records came to, came, to, came to light, one of the first questions is, what the hell are 80 million pages of paper? We're not going to read them all. No one can read that much. And so my colleagues and I designed a random sampling process in which we were able to statistically characterize the flow of documents among offices of the national police. Now, this has two important features. Because one of the things they found was that these two guys were given an award for their meritorious conduct on the day that he was disappeared, on the way Mr. Garcia was disappeared. And they were tried, and they confessed, saying, well, we were just following orders. Our statistical evidence first showed that the documents used in the case were consistent with, in every statistical sense, all the rest of the documents in the case, all the rest, excuse me, in the, in the archive. But a second and much more important finding is that the documents in the case were had the same flow. They had the same metadata that we now know that word from other purposes. They had the same metadata structure, the same flow through the organization in which operational strategies are designed on top, plans are developed at the next layer, orders are, de are, de are uh, defined at the next layer, passed to the operational layer, the operational layer does their job, they generate reports that go back up the chain. The bureaucracy was fully functioning. And seeing that, the judge said, thank you very much, you were just following orders. That is not a defense. Guilty, 40 years, goodbye. By the way, Madam Prosecutor, go find their boss. Hector Bol de la Cruz was the director of the National Police at the time of Mr. Garcia's disappearance. He was brought into court, and our statistical evidence uh, was used a second time, and I testified against him. He was convicted and sentenced to 40 years in jail. This is, thank you. This is an important act for justice, and this is an important act, I think, that I would like many police forces around the world to keep in mind right now. But most importantly for me, I'd like to take it back to it being important for people. This little girl has grown up. She's a human rights lawyer in Guatemala now, and here she is embracing her grandmother, Mr. Garcia's father. One of the most fundamental things we do in human rights is we speak to amplify the voices of those who've suffered. We speak to amplify the voices of the victims. And among the proudest things I've ever done in my life is to present statistics that have allowed the Garcia family to know when they can speak of their loved ones in the past tense. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.